Okay, I think we'll uh, I think we'll make make a start with some uh, some introductions and and get going properly in in, in a minute or two. So, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, ESCO research seminar. Uh, my name is Josh Martin. I'm a topic lead for for ESCO. It's my pleasure to be here introducing uh, Rachel Solovechik uh, for today's research seminar. Um, uh, and Rachel will, will kick off in a minute, but let me just say a few words uh, by way of introduction. Rachel is an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the United States. Her current work focuses on uh, natural resource exploration and the regional impact of product unavailability during uh, the pandemic. Um, but in her past work, she's also uh, done lots of work looking at difficult to think, difficult to measure things in, in the national accounts including the, the, the potential GDP and productivity impacts of, of uh, tracking capitalized advertising, free digital content, illegal activity, cultivated assets, valuables, um, entertainment originals, and, and lots of other things as well. Um, and Rachel uh, graduated from the University of Chicago and joined the BEA in 2007. Um, Rachel is going to talk to us today about a particularly interesting topic that I think is very relevant um, in the modern economy, and that's the value of data as an asset. And in particular, a really interesting case study about a particular type of data that's perhaps a little bit different to the sorts of data that we normally hear uh, economists talk about. And that's a case study around individual credit files. Rachel will talk for uh, about 40 minutes. We'll have time for some question and answers at the end. If you've got any questions, um, please put them in the, in the Q&A section of, of the Zoom. Uh, you should uh, have a button at the bottom that would allow you to do that. Um, and we'll take um, any sort of questions of clarification as we go through. So if you've got any, any questions that need an immediate answer, we can do that. Uh, but if you've got uh, more uh, sort of questions of discussion um, for Rachel, then we'll take those at the end and we'll have plenty of time for that, I'm sure. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll, um, I'll hand you over to Rachel. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much to, uh, to Sarah Shepard at ESCO and Josh Martin for setting this up. Um, they're handling all the tech support. So I'm going to be saying next slide, please, um, for Sarah. So next slide, please. So this is just a preview. I'm trying to show you how large data investment could be. And these are just two case files. The blue line is individual credit files that I'm going to be studying. I don't know exactly what terminologies you use in the United Kingdom, but in the United States, this word refers to basically what your credit bureaus, they keep on you. And if you want to do anything in life, they check and get those credit files to see whether you're a reliable person. So this is like basically a public mark of your character. And then I've also starting to look at tax forms. And I, that's not in this paper, though I do use some of the price indexes from that paper. But just you can see that both forms of data, they're large. They're almost as large as the other types of capital that BA tracks. And these are just two case studies. If you count, I don't know how to measure all data together, but I suspect that if you measured all the data together, it would be larger than all the other investment types put together. And so like, even though I don't have anything that say Diane Coyle is studying, that doesn't mean that I don't have valuable stuff. I'm just doing a subset and this subset is pretty large. Next slide, please. And so I just want to give you a flavor of, you know, why the numbers are so high. So the previous research, they're sort of the tip. They're studying, you know, a lot of raw digital data generally. The people, they have web scraping, you have the browser history and they try to turn that into insights. Or you might have the machine uh, producing data as it's running. And so there's a whole lot of data that's sort of raw it's huge data sets, needs really fancy machine learning in order to use. And I'm studying stuff kind of at the bottom. These are files that are simple enough they can be stored on a piece of paper and they existed before computers. These are files that are, you know, tend to be standardized enough that you don't need to be a computer scientist to understand them. And because they're so simple, they're used in many, many more production processes than the stuff that you need to be a really sophisticated computer scientist. And so just there is a tiny amount of overlap, but really I'm just studying a very different type of data than other people have studied. And uh, next slide, please. And so this is another preview, just what happens to GDP quantities. And what you find is there's two times in which you have investment change a lot. So World War II was a very dramatic change. Basically, they made um, individual credit 
highly regulated and often illegal because they had so much stuff, people with money and they didn't have enough stuff. So it was a way to keep prices down that you couldn't borrow to buy it. In any case, a lot of the goods that people would have borrowed to buy, like cars, weren't available. And so this is not particularly exciting that everybody knew in World War II, there was this big change to the credit market. But there's something in the United States, the 1970 Fair Credit Reporting Act that I think needs more attention. This was an act that basically said that instead of them knowing your entire life history from the time you were a little kid, they could only know seven years of data. So that meant that after seven years, the data was just deleted. It disappeared as if it had never existed. And this is pretty rigorously monitored because there's only a couple of credit bureaus and they, even before the 1970 Fair Credit made it legal, they decided to adopt a voluntary industry guidelines. And if th somebody broke this rule, they could get in very big trouble because they're supposed to tell people if they are refusing to handle them because of bad credit data. So if you send somebody a letter saying, I'm refusing your mortgage because of something that happened 15 years ago, then they you know, know that the law was broken. And there's a lot of ways it's checked. And so this is something that happened in 1970 in the United States. I don't know when things happened in other countries, but I think there was in the 1970s a general worldwide trend to say that, you know, we don't want people's entire life history to be used against them with no limitations. And most countries, they have some sort of lifespan for their data. It varies, depends on the country, the exact rules of what can be kept and how you um, keep and how you monitor it. You know, those things vary a lot across countries so that you can't really take credit data from one country to the other. But just what you have is that credit data is artificially restricted because of this concern about people should have a chance to start over. So next slide, please. And so just the outline of the presentation, I'm gonna start out just describing the four main entities in the individual credit file system. And these entities each have their own place. And then I'm gonna estimate the benefits of credit data. And this is kind of why I do the case style. Other economists have these great papers where they have all these numbers. I don't have to do original research on how much a credit file is worth. I just have to take the research. What happens if your credit score gets a little bit better? And then I have another thing. I can look at immigrants from the UK who have perfectly normal understanding of the credit market and understand how to get mortgages. They still can't get mortgages in the US because until you like have a US credit file, you basically don't exist. And then I'm gonna calculate investment. So I'm taking these numbers where I have the benefits, turning it into dollars each year. And then I'm going to recalculate what happens to GDP and productivity if we call this uh, credit data, a uh, file data, investment. And, you know, it's going to be not, you know, enough to change economic history because it's only one type of data, but it's surprisingly large for one case study. Next uh, slide, please. And so the first thing I want to talk about is data creators. This is basically anybody who loans any money. Obviously, banks and other financial service providers have the most detailed data because they have a whole, that's their business. And so if you have a credit card, it'll say what your credit limit is, how much money you have loaned now, and your very detailed payment history. But also, almost any service provider is going to report if you have a late uh, bill. Like if you have, a, if you're renting and you don't pay your rent, sooner or later, it's going to show up on your credit file. And in the past, it used to be a retailers did more credit services because you bought on credit without a credit card. And I don't, there's the country differences and whether it's the banks providing credit or whether it's other businesses providing credit. But in the modern developed world, you basically, almost everybody buys regularly on credit. So you sort of, there's a lot of data out there on you. And this is something, at least in the United States, is very generally known that you have, uh, when you uh, take out a loan, either explicitly or implicitly, you're building your credit. You have financial advisors tell people, take out loans uh, so that you uh, and pay them back so you can get good credit. And on the plus side, you know, secured credit cards and other beginning products, they market themselves, build credit, and they have higher fees. But of course, it's justified because you're getting a good credit rating. 
And on the negative side, if you're late with credit, the debt collectors, that is an entirely legal and very common threat that if you don't pay, we're going to tell the credit bureaus and then you won't be able to get any more credit. And it's not an externality because individuals choose to apply for loans and businesses choose to report data to credit bureaus. So an externality in the SNA sense, uh, sorry, system of national accounts, the official guidelines for national accounting, that's really about, you know, if somebody does something to you when you don't want it and you can't stop it. But externalities, if you're choosing to apply for a loan, you know you're gonna get it reported and you probably want it anyway. And a business, they don't have to report any credit data. The only thing is if they don't report credit data, then they can't lie and say they are. And that's a big uh, incentive to repay. So I'm just gonna treat it as a secondary product that's bundled with a credit card. When I get a credit card, I get the direct financial services, but I also get the building credit aspect. And so what happens is you basically take what we already knew their output was, and then we cut, take out some of the financial services and push some of it into the uh, data. No change to that industry value added, just change to what type of products they're buying. Next slide, please. And so the credit bureaus, they get a lot of attention and because they are sort of a key part of the system, but they're surprisingly small, $4 billion. It's not trivial, but there's just not much for them to do because the banks already get everything into the proper format. And their job is basically to make sure that the banks aren't lying about it. And um, they sort of organize, if somebody has a credit card with two banks, they put them together so you can see their total credit. And it's very, very competitive both because you have three uh, major players that are nearly indistinguishable. And also a 1933 antitrust case says that if you have a credit bureau, can't really you know, use it in-house. Um, in There's a couple of minor exceptions for like marketing purposes, but basically you can't have one credit bureau say, we don't like the store, so we won't sell it to it. And so they're simple intermediaries. And so I'm not really gonna study them much because they're not, large enough or ha don't have enough control. What really matters is sort of the other three players who are really doing all the, you know, decision making. The so credit bureau is, has no more control than your email server has over what emails you send. Next slide, please. So individuals are the most important players. They can, in the United States, they control their credit data. That it's illegal to check somebody's credit without their permission with a couple of minor exceptions. And this is enforced that if you take any negative action against somebody, which could even be you give them a credit card, but not quite as much high a limit as they'd like, you have to tell them that they're denied services. And so there are big penalties if you don't tell them. So it's really hard to sneak and look at people's credit file without their permission. And so individuals don't have complete ownership because they can't fake positive information or delete true negative information. The credit bureaus monitor to make sure the information is accurate. And um, at any time, individuals can get their own data. So if they don't like working through the credit bureau, they can just ask for a copy and then give it to whoever they want. And general credit data benefits individuals because um, if you refuse to share a, your score, the, the um, uh, lenders, they take the reasonable approach that you must be uh, refusing to share something very negative. And even if you genuinely don't have any data, they also, you know, you're considered too risky to work with. That young adults have many, you know, risks just because of their age. But one thing is that the credit bureaus also, they don't, people don't know what they're like. They don't have a long enough history to see if this 18 year old is responsible or not. So they're cautious to start out. Next slide, please. And so finally, you have the data users. And there's a general, firms use data to predict the future more accurately. And this is pretty obvious. Lenders, credit score is highly, highly correlated with the risk of defaulting on a future loan. And this matters, of course, if you're trying to decide if somebody's a good credit risk. And insurers use credit score to predict claims risk. I don't quite know why, but there is a very high correlation between bad credit score and accident risk. And so insurers, they tend to um, use it and it's legal in the United States in most places. And then finally, uh, 
Hiring managers use credit files to predict future job performance and theft risk. Exactly why there is this strong relationship, we don't quite know, but it's a known thing and hiring managers generally check credit. And if they see a red flag, they, they're not necessarily going to deny somebody you know, completely. They might just talk with them to figure out what happened and why at that part of their lives. And so what you have is I'm gonna do is and firms implicitly pay customers for data by offering lower prices. So if I wanted to keep my privacy, I could, but I have to pay very high rates for any loans, very high rates for any insurance and um, anything else where they check the credit. And same thing, if I wanted to get a job without giving up my privacy, then I'm gonna have to accept lower wages. And you also have business owners use their personal credit and it is, very frequently checking personal credit of a business owner. So you sort of get higher returns because you're willing to share your credit data. And so privacy is extremely expensive in the United States because basically everybody wants to know your financial history. Next slide, please. And so these are just huge benefits associated with individual credit. And in the United States, these are very easy to measure because we have a really strict rule at seven years, everything negative except chapter seven bankruptcy goes off and that goes off at 10 years. So you have these um, regression discontinuities, same person before and after, but one month they have a bankruptcy flag and one month they don't. And so you can just see what happens when the bankruptcy flag goes off and people's credit score goes up. You can calculate how much lower interest payments, lower insurance premiums, higher earnings. And this is interesting because the Dobby et al. paper keeps on talking about, oh, it's not significant, um, you know, the increase in earnings. But I think a 0.2 percentage point in increase in employment, which is statistically significant, even if they think that it's not economically significant, it's only six points. And so the range of credit scores in the United States might be 200 points. And so... Uh, getting a job versus not getting a job on a 200 point difference, that's huge. And you have surveys, 14% of people with bad credit say they lost a job offer. And most important of all, you know, self-employment earnings go way up when you um, have good credit. Part of it is that business owners almost always have to borrow in order to keep their business going. But even besides that, you it's hard to sign at least if people think you have a bad credit. You might not be able to... Um, get jobs if um, your uh, customers check your credit and say, I don't want to give a deposit to somebody who, you know, has a history of bankruptcy. And these benefits really only apply to genuine data. In the United States, we have something called credit repair agencies that they do offer credit repair services and they're not all scams, but some of them do raise the credit score, but mostly they raise the credit score by gaming the formula. And so, banks and other heavy credit users, they're sophisticated enough to see these uh, people are gaming the formula because they're they basically they figure out how to get their things off of the formula, but it's still there for anyone to see if they look. And so like you can't look at the credit repair agency. If you could buy real true high quality credit, but it's just like it's trying to be young by having uh, Botox. It, it helps a little bit because it does make you look better, but it doesn't solve the fact that wrinkles are associated with being old. Next slide, please. So valuing the average credit file. So the benefits per point are pretty easy to calculate. You just take all the existing literature from the bankruptcy flag, and these are very large. It adds up to like $30 um, per point. So if you went from say the 25th percentile of 600 something to the um, um, 75th percentile of 800 something, that's worth uh, 30 uh, times 200 or $6,000 a year. And that sounds crazy, but th think about your personal lives. If you lost your credit cards, if you couldn't get a mortgage, you couldn't get a car loan. This is the life of people in the United States with poor credit. It's very difficult for them to do anything. Uh, that requires any type of implicit or explicit credit. And it's harder to figure out what's the about no credit file because obviously the young adults, they're like legitimately have no credit file, but they also have so much other stuff going on in their lives when they're 18. And what we have is a very good example of brand new immigrants. They have no credit file 
And if you look at, say, immigrants from the United Kingdom or Australia, these are people who are very familiar with the credit system and uh, speak English, know how to operate, but they still can't get mortgages in the United States because they just don't have the U.S. credit file. And you would think, why can't you take your British credit file? It doesn't work that way because of complicated legal things. It's not completely impossible, but the credit bureaus are kind of risk averse and they don't want to risk getting data they're not allowed to have. And so like, so I'm calculating you're basically about the 25th percentile if you have no credit file. So the average file is going to yield $4,000 in benefits per year. Because not everybody is, you know, the top, but there's a lot of people who are in the middle. And so all my investment numbers are calibrated to match this $4,000 per year. And of course, everything goes up or down, you know, in, in turn, if you change the $4,000. Next file, play Next slide. And this is just to show how dramatic the effects are. Because you could look at the American Community Survey, do people own a house? And if they do, do they have a mortgage? So these new immigrants, they're actually the more likely to own without a mortgage than they own with a mortgage. I don't think that means they own the house completely, um, you know, without debt. It's more likely that they own the house, you know, because they borrow money in their birth country and uh, they're using that to sort of tide them over until they get uh, can get an American mortgage. But after a couple of years, they really, you know, converge to the American norm. And if you control for like education and um, AIDS and stuff, you get a little bit, you know, even more dramatic because in general, the immigrants from the United Kingdom tend to be pretty well educated and they tend to be a little bit older than the average American. So it, it takes a while, only a couple of years, but you can see that it's very, very difficult to get uh, a mortgage without a credit file. So next slide, please. And this is just once again, nominal data investment over time. So it's very hard to measure investment directly because you can't see you know, who was writing the credit file. You have the bill collectors people um, and I'm using them as a proxy. So this is my nominal investment is half based on the uh, debt balance, which I have great data from the Federal Reserve. And I'm including all individual debt. So that's stuff like the mortgage, which even though, uh, the official national accounting rules are that it's a small business renting a home to the owner. It's really people use their individual credit file to get a mortgage. And um, so it depends on your individual. Same thing with the small business loans tend to be, you know, based on the owner's individual credit. You have to be very large to get uh, loans based on the credit of a business, which is separate from you. And that's in fact, the whole point of a limited liability company that you can get loans without, you know, any knowing anything about the individual owner. And so what you see is, you know, nominal investment has kind of hovered around 4% of GD, 4 to 6% of GDP, except for the dip around World War II and the slow recovery. And uh, you have a little bit of a dip after, you know, the 2008 financial crisis. So next slide, please. So just what happens to GDP if data is capitalized? So the first thing, it's easy, the data creators. So they give the credit data, it's bundled with their primary output, which is generally financial services, but could be anything. Because if I'm getting an apartment, it's bundled with apartment services. So what happens is primary output goes down and secondary output goes up by the value of data. So I'm not really changing anything about the um, industry, except I'm changing, you know, what I'm calling the output. And this matters when I have prices, but doesn't matter at all for the nominals. So individuals, you have investment goes up by the value of credit data received, because instead of getting a short-term service, I'm getting a long-lived intangible asset credit data. And personal consumption expenditure, which we call PCA, goes down by the portion of uh, per credit data investment that's currently tracked as consumer financial services. So if I have a personal credit card and I'm paying, I don't know, $1,000 in fees every year. So right now we track, track that as consumer spending. I must be enjoying the $1,000 of uh, credit card services. But I'm saying a lot of this 
is actually I'm buying data as an investment. So maybe my consumer spending is only $500 and $500 is I'm investing in my future by getting a credit file data. And then this personal consumption expenditure also goes up a little bit because if I'm using my credit file data to get discounts on consumer purchases. So, and so these two things don't cancel out because a lot of credit file services are used for buying a house. An 18 year old starting out, they pay a lot for their credit card. And then when they're 25, they might use it to get a house or to get a job. And so personal consumption expenditure, the services tend to be much lower than the, um, than the shifted spending. The net effect is that people are spending, uh, are enjoying less consumption than we think. And this sort of can be seen as, you know, that some spending is sort of related for living your life and others is just, you know, for the future. And so what happens to data users? They're sort of the converse of the individuals. Their intermediate inputs goes by, up by the value of credit data services used. So they weren't explicitly paying for credit data services except the tiny amount they're giving to the credit bureaus just for processing the files. But they're getting a whole lot more inputs because they're getting this really valuable data from their customers and their workers and, their, and sometimes their owners. And so that's being used in production because they have to predict what's going to happen. And so what happens is once I've called this intermediate input, my labor compensation and my capital compensation go down because these things are really payment for data services. So if you're hiring a worker, part of his wages is really about, you know, can I violate your privacy and see all of your most embarrassing history? And output goes up a little bit because if you give it price discounts given in return for customer data. So what's going to happen is you're going to have by construction, if labor and capital go down, you're having value added go down because when intermediate when you call something intermediate rather than labor or capital, it's going to change uh, what's counted as value added. But at the same time, the profits for the business owner don't change. They have the same costs and the same revenues. It just sort of shifts on how we call it. Next slide, please. And so what you see basically is the investment and the decrease in PCE almost exactly cancel out. So just reclassifying, you know, data as, uh, you know, a capital asset doesn't change, doesn't change that much GDP uh, or nominal GDP. Because basically most of the um, individual credit file creation is done by consumers because they're the ones who use the credit cards. They're the ones who uh, sort of are the riskiest people that, once you're getting a business or a mortgage loan, you're already pretty safe. And so you don't need to add that much more data about yourself. It's the 18 year olds who you're giving a credit card or an auto loan and hoping that everything works out. And so then you have a little bit of a bump up from consumer discounts, that's the orange line, but it, it's pretty small relative to the other two things. And so it's not something that really changes GDP growth much. And I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it because it's not, 100% clear it should be in GDP. Some people might say that it's non-market, it's a type of human capital, and so it should be in the household production account. But the blue and the um, yellow line are definitely in GDP because they're produced by the market sector. You, you could, of course, you know, make up your own credit file and tell it to the credit bureaus, but they're not going to listen to you. They really want the official credit bureau file as reported by the banks. Next slide, please. And so the prices and depreciation for credit data. So costs are basically self-reported wage bills uh, for bill collectors in the census. And then I'm adjusting for labor productivity growth in the accounting sector that I have a companion paper that hasn't actually been fully written, but I have the price section worked out. And it's basically the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a producer price index for accounting. And it's sort of tracked GDP because wages go up, but then computers help. It's not that you can't have, you know, credit files without computers, but computers makes them much easier. And so what I'm doing is it's basically, you wouldn't be far off if you said that it tracks GDP growth over time, that there's enough computers to offset the wage growth. And, but this is all the costs. 
you have this critical thing happening, you know, with uh, credit files is they're very heavily regulated. So the 1970 Fair Credit, it reduced the lifespan from decades uh, to seven years. So I'm saying that cuts the quality in about half. Just like if you've got a car that went from a de decades lifespan to seven years, you wouldn't be happy. And then you also, some states have restrictions that employers can't look at credit. And that's also lower quality because if you have rules, you can't look at these credit. And so what I calculate is that a full restriction would cut the quality by about half again, but only about 23% of Americans are impacted. So at this moment, it's a pretty small adjustment. Though, of course, it may change if the federal government ever decided to make this rule, uh, then there would be a huge change to credit quality because suddenly you can't use it for employment. And so the, just the price is cost divided by quality. So uh, um, this is very simple calculations that I have my cost index and I just adjust for these quality changes. Next slide, please. And so here's what happens to the GDP price index. And so you can see there's a sudden jump in credit file uh, costs because they suddenly passed this law and it really was implemented very quickly. It might not have been implemented quite as instantly as they'd like, but people knew it was coming. And so even if you had a delay of a year or two in getting all the files processed, then that was enough to, you know, have the sudden jump in, you know, investment costs. And so this is a pretty big change. So this is like a one and a half, uh, so, sorry, two two and a half percent inflation rate in this one year, and so this is something that's pretty noticeable when you look at real GDP growth. Next slide, please. And so here you can see you have pretty much the same effect on real GDP growth as you had on um, in 1970 as you had on the prices. And World War II, even though you had a decrease in investment, it was mirrored by the fact that. Um, it wasn't in PCA, so there wasn't any real change to overall growth in World War II. But when you have <coughs> this is 1970, it's a very dramatic one-time change. And you might say that's crazy. That's, you know, a huge amount of data loss. But there's a, many economics papers arguing we should have credit bureaus and saying if you had a good credit bureau in places like Japan, you would get, you know, several percent GDP growth increase because credit files are that important. And you can see economist articles in the developing world, if you don't have a credit file, it's just very hard to do a lot of stuff. And um, how important it is when you introduce credit files to the country. But of course, you can't see this type of thing in many European countries because they've had credit files for decades, if not centuries. But just, this is a one-time shift because they changed the rules. Next slide, please. And so this is total factor productivity. And total factor productivity, it's a little bit different because you have the decrease in output that I showed on the GDP slide, but you also have the decrease in input. The businesses don't know as much about their customers and that makes it harder to work. And so right now that's sort of tracked as you know, productivity growth goes down and suddenly a business can't figure out, you know, who's gonna get in accidents or which tenant is gonna, you know, have a loud party that they need to be evicted for. But, and so it looked like productivity growth and I'm spreading it across the 1970s because I don't think that happened instantly. If nothing else, if you already had a credit file report before 1970, you could keep on using it. it this law really only applied to credit bureaus. But what you find is the decrease in real inputs is larger than the de decrease of real output. And that's because of, mostly because of the discount rate that, um, something that will happen in seven years, it, you do think about it, but it's not as important as something that's happening right now. So the businesses right now, they lost all this data, whereas the output people, they discounted the future damage where the businesses weren't discounting it at all. And so the net effect is that measured productivity in the 1970s goes up. It's not that we're increasing real output much. What we're doing is instead saying, we had this previous mysterious decline in productivity growth in the United States. Maybe some of it is the 1970s Fair Credit Reporting Act. And I wanna make it clear that this doesn't mean the 1970s, it was a bad idea. People really do value their privacy. And the idea of businesses could be slightly more efficient if they spied on you is really you know, disturbing that 
um, people are willing to accept a certain amount of inefficiency so they don't have, uh, you know, everybody know everything negative about them. And the truth was, uh, the credit files I'm studying are actually some of the nicer parts of the business spying. They used to send private investigators to your neighbors and ask them if, you, if they knew any nasty gossip on you. And um, so you had all these people, you know, sometimes it was, you know, real things like this person is uh, always getting drunk. Maybe you shouldn't give him car insurance. But sometimes it was, I think they're doing stuff bad sexually. Um, you should probably not hire him. And there was no standards of evidence, no standards of, you know, that you had the right to know why you were discriminated against. And finally, there's also something to be said for inequality, that people who have bad credit ratings, they already have a lot of things going wrong in their life. They're often, you know, have poor health, precipitates, you know, financial problems or financial problems precipitates poor health. And so we have some sort of, maybe we want to help out these people by not having it follow them for the rest of their lives. And there is a real trade-off that it's often inefficient, you know, to help out people at the bottom, but sometimes it's worthwhile to do so anyway. So I don't want you to, people come away saying the Fair Credit Reporting Act was the worst idea in the world and we could just get, you know, all these benefits if we could just get it back. But it's interesting that right now, you know, the internet is undoing some parts of the Fair Credit Reporting Act because it really, uh, that law only affects credit bureaus. And now with social media, businesses can just sort of directly find all the um, gossip and negative stuff about people they want to investigate without going through a bureau. And in the United States, it's definitely something we're worrying about, that should people be indefinitely punished for minor things they might or might not have done, but some neighbor alleged they did 20 years ago? And so maybe, you know, this is uh, becoming increasingly irrelevant, but at the very least, for banks and insurance companies in the United States, as far as I know, haven't yet started using the internet to collect random gossip about people like they used to. Next slide, please. So just other data research. I'm, I'm working on a paper to value tax forms, and tax forms are very easy to value because we have an official publication that says how long it takes to fill them out. Just multiply that by accounting costs, and then you get the, co the accounting time. Um, and so tax forms and individual credit file are sort of complementary. Tax forms tell the income, and the credit file tells sort of your character. Uh, by the United States standards, your credit score does not depend on your income, and your tax forms don't depend on your credit score. But a lot of businesses use both if they're trying to decide whether you'll end up paying back a loan. Are you able to based on your income and are you going to based on your character? And then you have extensions of the credit data research. So I so far have only looked at individual credit data that's looking at the people, but you also have business and government credit scores that if you're a large business or you're a government, you get your own credit score, something like a Moody's uh, rating or something like that, or even if you just show up in the directory at all, being a business, if you're not in the business directory, it does really hurt. Other standardized data, criminal and civil court documents, arrest records, uh, you know, divorce decrees, insurance claims, uh, if you've gotten a car accident or not, and what happened, medical records like vaccine cards, if people know in the uh, modern world. It doesn't matter if you're vaccinated against coronavirus. It matters if you have the official documentation. And I know people who had to get revaccinated because they didn't have the right vaccination things for official purposes. And long term, I'd like to study non-standardized data. This is basically gossip. It's on in person online. It's very important. As people can see in the United States, we had the Me Too movement that your career was basically ruined if people, um, if there was the word out that you were an abuser. And so, and it's of course a very important thing for a company to know, is this person likely to commit crimes while working for us? But it's harder to measure um, because it's not yet standardized in the same way that you have this other stuff. And so exactly what's included in gossip and how to measure it. Next slide, please. So just conclusion, I showed that individual credit files are an important intangible asset. 
So investment is 0.8 trillion and capital stock is 4 trillion. These are large numbers and this is just one type of data. That data is a very, very large intangible asset because it's basically how the modern world works, at least in the United States. Um, nothing works unless it's in the proper format and the proper paperwork. And what you do is you, it, if you capitalize it, you're raising the level of GDP by a little bit. And it depends on exactly on what you decide to count in GDP. But nominal GDP growth isn't changed much, but you have this one-time drop in real GDP growth, and you have this one-time rise in TFP growth in 1970s. And also, if you want to look at the personal consumption impact of capitalized credit, what you have is consumption goes down because some of the spending that we were calling consumption before, it was really, you know, it's a job-related expense that you can't keep your... Um, your job if you don't have a credit card. And so um, you don't, you might even not want this credit card, but you know you have to do it if you want to have a business or, um, and so what you have is real PCE growth is going to fall slightly, but just sometimes when people feel like they're not getting ahead, even though they have a large income, some of it is because they feel like they have to spend money on things that we call consumer spending and credit card services are just one of them. So thank you so much for listening nicely. I'm eager to hear your questions. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, and and uh, yeah, very, very interesting. I learned a lot about uh, the, the, the sort of the data landscape uh, and, and particular credit ratings in the US. I, 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 shall, um, I shall say something in a second about how I think that sort of relates a little bit to the UK. Just to say uh, we've got uh, about 15 minutes for, for Q&A so if anyone does have any questions feel free to pop them in the Q&A section in Zoom and, and we can certainly ask those uh, in, in a moment. Rachel I just wanted to take a, a, a moment to, to respond um, very briefly if I may to, to some of the some of the really interesting points that you made and I'd encourage everyone to have a look at the paper um, as well which has got lots of uh, extra really fascinating detail in. Um, you, uh, so you've been talking about um, the, these credit files. I, I think the equivalent in the UK, uh, which is not very different, we, we might call that credit ratings or credit reports. And there are, as, as, as you said, for the US, there are similar sort of um, aggregator companies for the UK. And we get lots of advertising on, uh, on UK telly, uh, UK TV for um, sort of check, check your credit rating and what you can do to boost it and so on. So I think the environment in the UK is actually quite similar to, to the US. Um, I'm not familiar with yeah. the sort of the legislative points that you were making. You actually have some of the same companies, but for some reason the companies can't send a credit file from one country to the next. So it's really weird just, you know, because the laws are tiny bit different. They're scared to, you know, share data. Sure. So, so I, I mean, I think a lot of the um, framework that you were talking about probably carries across to the UK, although obviously the specifics will be a little bit different. One of the things that the paper does really nicely, which um, you, you, you touched on, but I think in the interest of time didn't go into too much detail, is about how there's all of these different studies that, that use these um, th this uh, regression discontinuity uh, technique that you were describing, where because this uh, bankruptcy flag gets taken away after seven years, you can look at sort of the before and the after and what happens to the credit score and then what happens to other economic outcomes as a result. So. Uh, your your interest payments, your your employment uh, uh, chances, your your wages, and so on. Um, and I thought that was a really fascinating set of literature in the paper. That there's all of these. I mean, maybe uh, naively, I, I sort of didn't think about all the implications that a credit rating could have on your life. But as you demonstrate, there's lots of them. And when you add them all up, um, it, it it turns out to be quite econo economically meaningful. So. I thought that was a, a really fascinating uh, discussion in the paper. Yeah, this is kind of why I picked this case study because other people have done all this research. The Federal Reserve has this wonderful consumer credit panel and people have started using it because you can, tr the researchers are allowed to track people and remember who had the bankruptcy flags, but for some reason companies can't. And so like, I don't know if the UK has a similar consumer credit panel, but somebody has done something like that for Sweden and found an even larger impact. Though it's a little misleading because the Swedish people, they were tracking some really negative stuff rather than the US bankruptcy is kind of common and isn't so bad. Thanks. I, I, I'm not familiar with the literature in the UK. That there, there, there may be some, but um, I, I thought the way that you used the literature to your advantage here was, um, was, was, was really excellent. 
Thank you. I, I see we don't have any questions yet. So let me pose one of my own, if I may. The data that you were describing, and you pointed this out yourself, is different to the sorts of data that other um, or some other economic scholars have been thinking about, which tend to be more sort of big data um, in, in, in some way. And, and that got me thinking that with the discussion about bringing data as an asset into the national accounts boundary, should we be thinking about some sort of classification for data um, to account for its uh, different types and different characteristics? Just yeah, as, in, just as I would say that each type of data probably should be tracked separately because they often have very different production processes. Like big data, like browser history, I assume is created based on internet you know, usage and is very automatic. And um, a lot of the stuff other people have been studying, it is it is data and worth tracking. It's just so different that having its own price index um, is not necessarily the right thing to do. Yeah, indeed, different different price indices, different uh, depreciation rates potentially as, as well. Yeah. And, and that, that's very relevant when we're thinking about different capital assets. Yeah, that's another reason I'm attracted to the, to the credit file data that I know exactly its lifespan. That other stuff, you have to figure out the lifespan by all these complicated methods, which, of course, they often get good numbers, but just it's a lot of work. This one, I didn't need to do any work. And I see there's a question in Q&A from Jay Mitchell. Yeah. Can we, can we, get, uh, can we get Jay Mitchell off, um, off mute and, and they can ask their question? Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> so it's John. John Mitchell. Hi, hi John. Uh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, obviously, uh, to a very clear presentation um, uh, on a subject that isn't always clear. So you did a very good job of, of piecing together all the bits. Um, I have quite a few questions, uh, but I might just focus on the one that I put there for now. Um, you mentioned that there was an element of PCE which could be considered as contributing to GDP, um, which is the different discounts uh, that may be given to someone if they have good credit versus the, the price that someone with bad credit may need to pay. And I think you use the um, interest rate differential um, for taking out a loan. Um, I guess my, what I'm sort of suggesting is that the SNA, we measure the transactions based on market price. Now, we could argue about the, the fairness of offering different interest rates based on credit histories. But ultimately, both the consumer and the producer are entering the transaction quite willingly, um, albeit at different prices. So doesn't that still reflect a market price? And if it is the market price, then isn't that the price that we should be using for GDP? You're probably right. This is the orange line was, I had it separately because it was sort of a vague, you know, thing. If you think the data is a capital asset, then an individual who lets a business use their data, you know, and they're compensated for it, maybe that should be in GDP. But if you think it's a type of human capital and they're just getting, you know, benefits of it, then maybe it should really be in household production, that I'm using a household asset to, you know, like sort of like if I'm a good shopper and I get a discount on groceries. So I'm a good, I'm a good mortgage buyer and I, sorry, I'm a good um, auto loan buyer and I get a discount on auto loans. I think if you're measuring productivity uh, for the business sector, you definitely should treat it as an input somehow, because from the business's point of view, maybe if they're producing less output than we think because they're producing output to people, so they're selling to people who are good loans versus selling to people who are bad loans. But you're right, I'm not sure that PCA should be in GDP. But fortunately for me, it's actually not so large. So how you handle it doesn't matter as much as all that. Thanks very much, Rachel. J John, you said you had a couple of questions. Now, I'm sure Rachel would be happy to, to, to follow up um, outside of this, this call, but, but, but we do also have a little bit more time. So if you wanted to pose another question, um, then you'd be very welcome to. Uh, uh, no worries. Uh, I probably uh, can't articulate them quite as well. I guess, um, again, uh, I've, we've sort of done a lot of work on trying to capitalise data, and I suppose this comes at it from a different viewpoint in that it really comes from almost a, an income perspective, whereas we've really focused on a sum of costs. Um, and so I certainly see the idea of apportioning uh, some of the uh, consumption expenditure into an investment. I, 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 perhaps, Rachel, I'm probably not entirely sold on the idea that it's an asset 
for the household. Um, and if it was, I, I guess I would wonder within the SNA exactly what asset class that is, or, or more accurately, what production is that asset contributing to if it is an asset held by the household sector? Um, assets in the SNA need to contribute to production, otherwise they're um, uh, valuables or consumer durables. Um, and I guess maybe it could be a consumer durable, but uh, that kind of own account consumer durable isn't really uh, a normal thing either. I, I see it much more as a asset for the for the firm that is providing the information. I know you mentioned that the credit bureaus don't own the data, but I guess that they are putting some value added in organizing the files and making them easily attainable, the information easily attainable for the, the jobs or the firms that are inquiring about them. So um, I certainly agree that it is an asset. I'm just not sure if I agree with the, the sector that you've placed it in. This is a very uh, complicated question and I'll try to answer it as best as I can. But um, this, I consider an asset of the individual, I'm sort of drawing on Diane Coyle's research where she shows uh, that data is the most valuable when it's uh, used broadly and when it's uh, matched up with many other data sources. And if each firm kept their data proprietary, um, then it would be very hard to do that. And so it's socially efficient for all this data to be combined by the credit bureau. But if the credit, the credit bureau really doesn't own the data because um, they can't deny an individual who just wants their credit data and any business that wants it gets it for, you know, just essentially the cost of sending it over. That the credit bureau, um, they, they have a very strictly defined rule um, of what they can do and it doesn't include sell, like, Credit bureaus do not run credit repair um, scams. They could make insane amounts of money if they threaten people, unless you pay us $1,000, we're gonna destroy your credit rating. But that's illegal and would be caught very, very quickly. So it's definitely not the credit bureau owning it. Um, and I don't think the banks own it either because they don't even have it on their books. They sent, or they do, but they sent it over all uh, to um, the, company so to the credit bureaus so it has if you look at sort of the extra profits for the business that it shouldn't be extra profits for the business because that would be inefficient because then the data isn't being used very broadly what broad data you're not going to see extra profits on any you know one company using it because that company you know is only getting what everyone else can get too this is just a standard competitive market thing that the value generated by anything is better if it's sold in a competitive market. And it's possible to maintain a competitive market for data because the individuals, they benefit enough from data. Maybe they would like it if they had even more control and could fake the data, but like they, they have very limited amounts of control over the data. They can just share it with whoever they want. So that's my argument that it's not a business asset because it's, but that's okay. You can have, assets used in business production, which are owned by households. You have that all the time. For example, cars in the United States, small businesses often you, or big businesses often pay, you know, employees for the usage of their car, like they reimburse them per mile for driving on the job. Home offices, you have, you know, people own their house, but then you rent, uh, you essentially are renting it to your business. There's nothing conceptually forbidden about that. And so I'm sorry, you had a long question. I think I may have missed some of your other points. If you could remind me of them. Uh, no, I think that's okay. You did a pretty good job of, of, of covering the, the sector issue, which was the main point um, that I was probably suggesting. Um, and, and as I said, uh, Rachel, it's a, it's a very useful paper um, in terms of thinking about this from a different perspective, because most of the work in this area so far has really come from just a sum of cost um, perspective. Um, so I, I think it, it certainly adds to the discussion. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was going to answer the sum of costs. Yeah, national accounting, um, in general, we believe that sum of costs equals um, expected future benefits. And we use them sort of interchangeably depending on what is easier to measure. For example, when we measure the value of intangible assets, it's often done through, you know, expected future 
through revenue, like say research and development, we measure its lifespan. Wendy Lee's research, it was sort of how long it contributes to firm profits. And um, of course they're not always identical, but they're hopefully close enough that it's not a first order problem with national accounting. Thanks very much, Rachel, and, and thanks, John, for, for lots of uh, re really good, great questions there, and, and I think that speaks to how um, interesting and important this this research is, um, and and lots uh, lots still to be discussed on the international stage about uh, about measuring data. I'm sure. So that just about brings us uh, to the end. Um, so let me say once again a, a, a massive thank you to to, to Rachel for for presenting a really fascinating paper, and I'm, I'd encourage everyone to to go away and read the paper, which is uh, which is, is is really good as well. Now, Rachel is actually uh, in London in the UK uh, next week uh, and is uh, kindly available to, to meet with anyone locally who, who'd be interested in chatting to her about this paper or any of her other uh, really interesting research. Uh, so if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to arrange that, uh, you could get in touch with Rachel directly uh, or with me at josh.martin at bankofengland.co.uk. Um, uh, let me just say a few few other points uh, in closing. Um, so firstly, we have uh, the, the research seminar series uh, is, is now finished uh, for this year, but we'll be back again in January and it will start again uh, with the first uh, lecture of the, of this, of the series uh, on the 12th of January. So do uh, make sure you tune back in for that. Uh, the ESCO annual research conference will be taking place in May of next year and the call for papers is currently open. It closes on the 16th of January. Uh, which is about a month away, uh, but of course we've got Christmas between now and then, so uh, don't forget uh, about that call for papers and make sure uh, if you'd like to to submit uh, by then. Uh, so let me just say uh, once again, thanks for thanks for attending, thanks to Rachel, um, and uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you very much for having me, and it was a great discussion. <laughs>